you know, moments like this are important moments, but these are also vital moments where, you know, when leadership builds something over years and years, and you guys have been faithful in, faithful in this city for so many years, and moments like this, we don't want to redefine. We actually want to encourage what you're doing and how can we do this better together. I really honor Wolfie and Ali and for um, many times when we back home and I would say almost in the comfort of, you know, where we live, I really, I always am admired by people who are willing to go out sacrificially, let go of everything for the sake of other people and other nations. Uh, many times my own heart, I walk the streets and even with Wolfie, I said to me, other day, man, I'm, one side I know I need to do what I need to do there and the other side I'm drawn to the nations to go, literally go. Go and live somewhere in some nation and trust God to help reach the harvest. And uh, our nation is really behind not just UK but Europe. There's a commitment that's come in our hearts that's really a focused commitment, which means we pray, we give, and we are going. It's not just an intention. There's action with our intentions that our whole nation has come behind reaching Africa and Europe and then beyond. So Africa and Europe has for us become the same priority. And we want to support and help what God is doing in this nation. And we've always spoke about assumptions, so I want to just tear out another assumption here. The assumption that you think, I know your whole life, your circumstances, your background, your context, your culture, and I'm coming with a silver bullet to give you an answer to all of that, that is an assumption I cannot do. The only thing I can do is trust the Holy Spirit that as we speak and as we gather together, the Spirit of God Himself will take what I say, will take whatever He's laid on my heart, and contextualize that and bring it and lay it in your heart that from there, principles and action and lifestyle will be cultivated that ultimately produce a culture that we want. There's no way that I understand all your context and that I understand the culture and even the culture sensitivities. So would you have a little bit of grace with me this morning? I am from Africa. I'm from South Africa. In fact, I'm not even English. I grew up as, I'm an Afrikaans guy. I only, I mean, I only spoke English when my life was in danger. And then, <laughs> here's really what happened. I, I went to a, when I wanted to go and study theology, um, I looked at the Afrikaans areas and I thought, no, I can't do that. That's too traditional for me. And the only place I ultimately ended up was an English place. And, um, and I really <laughs> battled with my English. So I was battling with God and I speak to people in Afrikaans and, and I would kind of ref- refuse to speak English um, just because, you know, many times we refuse things because we're insecure. And uh, I remember one day in my quiet time, God said, you either have to change your attitude or change your calling. Which one is going to be? So I chose to change my attitude. <laughs> and I'm glad I did. Otherwise, I would have never met you guys. I mean, there's something about when we open up our hearts and we stay teachable. And all I'm asking this morning, would you allow the Holy Spirit to be the great teacher in your heart this morning? Would you take all that you've done and all the great stories and none of you sitting here today as like really a new, new, new beginner that you've done nothing. And God sees that. And we want to honor you for every moment you've prayed, every moment you've called somebody and rejected you. Thank you for obeying. Thank you for trying. Thank you for picking up the phone. Thank you for picking yourself up again and say, okay, I'm going to try this again. And I know you're sitting in this place because you say, I want to, I'm going to keep on trying. But I hope something that happens in our heart today is that we move beyond the place of what we need to do to really get a deep conviction of who we are. Because that's the only thing that makes anything lost. And I really trust God as we continue, and I want to just pray for people first, and there's something that God showed me while we worship, and then open up our hearts. Would you do me a favor and just close your eyes just where you are, and would you pray a simple prayer of just submitting yourself to the Lordship of Christ, asking the Holy Spirit to reveal, to unveil, to convict, to clarify Why don't you put your main focus on the Holy Spirit?
Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. You're omnipresent. Thank you. We don't have to ask you to come down from heaven. You are here. You know, Mertz, and we pray that you would do something, that you would fulfill your promises, and especially for this moment. I've got such an expectation that this is not just going to be another moment. This is literally going to be a reignite of a movement again in people's hearts. While we worship, I just felt there's somebody here with headache. If you really battle right now with headache, would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you. I see you. Lord, I pray now in the name of Jesus that this headache would disappear right now. Be healed in Jesus' name. No distraction, God. I saw somebody with neck problems, and uh, it's prior to this meeting. It, you've been battling with your neck. If that is you, would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you. Just put your hands on your neck. Father, I thank you that we don't have to manipulate or do anything else. We can just by faith agree what you've done on the cross, Jesus. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus, every tissue, every muscle get in line with God's word right now. In Jesus' name we pray this. Father, now we come against every spirit of fear, intimidation, Father, anything that is restraining us and restricting us from not only hearing, but actually affecting the worlds around us. We take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Amen. I want to introduce you quickly to my family. I think they got a picture on there. And um, my beautiful family, I've got um, one wife. It's my first and my last wife. And, uh, uh, and then I have also I mean, two sons. The one is five years old and one is 12 years old. And ours um, came by faith and works. So we battled with, for about seven, four years for the, with our first child. The doctor said, we'll never have children. Um, and, you know, walking out of a doctor's office with the words that rings in your ear, you will never have children. It's kind of daunting, daunting, and I went to my wife and I said, we need to be very careful that we, you know, really decide who's going to have the final say. Because in our lives, the things that have the final say many times define us. And now we went before God, and I really felt God said, you will have children, and your first child will be a boy. And so we went back to the same doctor, and I said, listen, I really thank you, I honor you, and, but I really felt that God said that we will have children, so we want to continue with you guys, because you're going to catch the first child, and it's going to be a boy. So the guy looked at me, this guy is weird, maybe I am, and uh, so that's it, and then we then went through a lot of stuff, in um, 2000, my eldest brother passed away in a car accident, horrific car accident, and uh, at the funeral, um, the next day, my dad came to us and said, Lord, you've taken life from us. Would you give us life? And my wife, supernatural, with no medical help, conceived. And Jesse was born. And this same doctor was the doctor catching Jesse. And I said, you remember me? And he said, well, I remember you, yeah, because we've been journeying. And I said, remember four years ago? He said, we will never have children. And I came back to you and I said, I think we're going to have children. You've just caught the boy. I said, may this be a witness to you that you will never, ever stand with an excuse before God one day and said you did not know. There's something about the obstacles in life, and I know many of us, I mean, you live in a city, there's obstacles, there's challenges, there are difficulties, there's things that you, and you could almost get to the place where those difficulties and those obstacles start to define your life. And I hope this morning that you would say, Lord, I'm not going to allow these things to define my life. I am defined by what happened at the cross and not by what is going to happen, what is going to happen in the future. I'm already defined by what happened at the cross. Seven years later, we battle for another seven years. And seven years later, we look, look at what's born. And thank God we've got two precious children. Now, let me tell you, not once ever did we think it was normal not to have children? Not once. 
Every single moment, there were moments in our hearts, we longed just to hold babies in our hand. And people who don't have children, they know what you go through when you battle with this. Never did we think, for a couple, it's normal never to have children. Who of you think it's normal? Because it's not. It's normal to actually have children. In the same way, it is abnormal for a born-again believer to never have children. It is not normal. It's abnormal. And then what happens is when we cultivate a culture where it is okay for Christians to gather without the expectation for them to bear children, spiritual children, we have to clutter and add so much more to the church to give people a satisfaction that can only come through obedience. God has called us to make a difference in this world. And I believe as I was praying for this moment, I have such a sense in my spirit. I've been doing this in the last year, quite different places, but it's a, it's an overwhelming experience that I've had praying for you guys and preparing for this. And even at the back there the whole time, I'm, it's, I feel like this is not just going to be another moment. I feel like you've been so faithful over so many years. And God is coming and He's going to be lifting up your hearts. He's going to lift up your faith. He's going to lift up your spirit. That from this place, there's going to be a movement out. And you're going to see the things that you've been trusting God for. The things many of you have tried for. You've trusted God for. I'm so with Wolfie. You have trusted and you believe the stuff. But you just need a motivation, encouragement, and I pray tonight, this is not just going to be a equipping or a training, but this is going to be an impartation, and it's going to be a redefining, a refocus that's actually going to cause a movement that your congregations are going to grow, they should grow, and they will multiply because of what happened here today. I'm trusting God that this will not just be another moment. We say we live by faith. Now let's take that faith into this meeting today. And by faith, we're going to say this will not just be an information session. This is going to be a transformational moment that's literally going to help us catapult forward, move forward, and do what you desire. I don't have to tell you what you desire. I know what you desire. That's why you sit here. But may God help us that this happens in your heart. When it's a force moments, we have four sessions. The first two, just bear with me. I'm going to just fire hydrant, just share my heart. Then we will go into the practical. So if you sit there and say, hey, I want to know the practical, practical, we'll get there. Okay, this afternoon after you have lunch, I'll give you practical. Because then you're going to fall asleep, so we're going to go in small groups, and we're literally going to try to simulate and experience this. But before we get there, our natural tendency as human beings is we, we want to quickly know, give me the how, give me the tools. I mean, I can give you a tool. Here's a tool. I mean, we can do all kinds of things. But what makes it last is not the how and the what. It's the why. Why, why do this? Why be this? You see, when we talk about Jesus, I mean, I've had the privilege of giving my life to Christ at the age of six. And I uh, grew up an incredible Christian. My parents are farmers. Um, my grandfather was a phenomenal man of God who got saved only at the age of 21. Being his whole life in church, he started to read his Bible and realized he's not born again. And the environment that he was in never shared the gospel with him, the gospel of salvation. And then he got saved, and obviously, thank God, he started to teach and train his, his sons and his kids. And that is obviously my dad. And we grew up in a home where... as Parents that are farmers, there was no dualism. They just loved Jesus. They would literally, I remember traveling with my grandfather on the farm, and uh, there was, I mean, you'd see a sheep sick, and he would stop his vehicle and then pray for the sheep, and then sheep gets up, and there, it's like, wow, my grandfather's got superpowers. I mean, I had a little water on my finger here, and um, I showed my grandfather, and he said, you know, and he pulled off his truck. He said, let me show you what we do when that happens, when people are sick. He put his finger on my finger, prayed for me, he took it away, and it was gone. Now imagine being the age of five, and you see that with your own eyes. You cannot be normal. <laughs> you can't. I mean, there's something about, you know, I, I want to have that. I want to have a life that makes a difference. It is not just, see, friends, with your mind, your will, your emotions, you can learn things through your soul. You can do a lot of things. You can study things. But there's a spiritual component to it. Without that, it's dead. And something happened in my soul as a, a small little boy. Obviously, I, then I gave my life to Christ. 
And from a young age, I grew up in this environment where I saw miracles and I saw people's lives transformed and impacted in, in our community. Then I went to go and study theology because I knew that God has called me into the full-time ecclesiastical call. Why do I say it like that complicated? Because we confuse people by thinking that some are full-time and some are not. The only people who are not full-time are not born again. Because you can't be part-time born again. It's vital. It's critical to our conversation today. Because you're going to think this is what staff do and this is what leaders do and, and, and you dismiss yourself, but you're actually dismissing you from Christianity, not from staff. You're full-time born again. And something, as I studied, I started to need, not need to discover, okay, what's ministry and what's pastor and what's this? And, and I've been exposed to so many different streams and, and, and expressions and philosophies and theologies and almost to the point where I got confused. So God, how do we, how am I going to make this? What is ministry? And then ultimately, thank God, I was connected to every nation, his people back in the days. Um, in 1997, 96, I became part of them. And being on a journey, and even in that journey, I've had moments where I had to really wrestle through things in my soul. Is this really what you want to do? You know, I mean, people, I remember back in the days, the count was almost 18,000 people went through Bible school. And I asked, but how many of that resulted into church plants? How many of 18,000 people, imagine how many of that resulted into church plants wherever they went? I mean, the, people come on our campus in Stellenbosch and they there and we disciple them and while they're part of the system, they're strong and they look beautiful and they're involved and it's great. And we had a guy who came to London, six months later he backslidden. He said, God, this cannot be. Why? Why? And God said, because you've not walked with him, laid foundations, disciple him. And that's been the journey that I've been on. I remember I was sitting in a coffee shop waiting for somebody who's a cell leader in our context, back in the days when we call it cells. And God said, do you love this guy? I said, yeah, I do, God. He says, how many brothers and sisters does he have? Um, don't know. <laughs> Where does he live? Where's he from? Don't know. In fact, what's his future plans? I don't know. God says, do you really love this guy? No, I did love the guy. But you know what I love? My priority to spend time with him was linked to the system, was linked to he's a cell group leader. I need to spend time with him so that we can make sure his cell group works. But when he leaves the system, how, how will it go with him? How's he going to be? What's he going to do? How's he going to live life and face the realities of life? And that was deeply a moment where God convicted me. And I went into the, um, there's a beautiful place, Yonkersuk in Stellenbosch, and I sit and I wrestled with God. And I said, God, what are you trying to say to me? And God says, I want you to change your philosophy and your theology of ministry. I don't want you to change your actions. I want you to change your convictions. Because all action always flows from your deep-rooted convictions. And the conviction in my soul, I saw sitting and God starts speaking to me. I said, what do I do? And God says, I want, I've not called you just to facilitate meetings. Although I believe in these moments, I believe in preaching, I do. I by no way want to ever dismiss anything that we're doing, but there was something that we were not doing. And that was intentionally laying foundations systematically in people's lives that when they are not in the system, they will make it. And they will actually reproduce where they are. And I went back and God said, you need to make disciples. And I didn't know what, I didn't have this. I mean, I just had fear of God in my life. So it was a little bit rough back in the days. So I don't do it like this anymore. So I went back. I chose seven guys. I said, hey guys, I know you students and you don't study five o'clock in the morning. I know that. So five to six, so 30, let's meet in my home. Like that is early. I know. Because I want you to have no excuse that you're doing something else. Except sleeping. You can get up. So... And, and uh, so this guy was getting to my home. I said, all right, tell me, um, how do you lead someone to Christ? I don't know. Let me help you. This week, go and share your testimony. I don't do it this way anymore, but I said, if you don't share your testimony, don't come back. <laughs> because I kind of want, I was just in fear of God, to be honest. But you know what's the result? They did go and share their testimony. Some of them the first time in their life. They come back and say, Phil, and I started to see an energy 
released in people's lives that I could not generate through anything else. I started to see people feel like, there's meaning to my life. Wow. The, the reason why they never shared is because they're not confident. The reason why they're not shared, they were not equipped. Then I said, this is how you baptize somebody on the Spirit. You baptize them. I'm not going to pray for them. I'm not going to steal your fruit. Don't bring your fruit to me. You don't invite them to me. My group is closed. I want you to do it yourself. I'm rather going to encourage you to do it. I'm not going to take your fruit. And we started to do that. And those seven people, a few months later, there were 42 in the circles of people disciple. We took 25 cell groups. Now, God said to me, go to your cell groups. That's the second thing God said to me. And you asked him two questions. The first question I'll tell you now, and the second one I'll tell you when you're there. The first question is how to lead a cell group. So I asked the guys, and we had 100% success rate. Everybody knew how to lead a cell group. It was easy. They lead a cell group. I mean, this is what you do. This is the form. This is the pattern. This is what you do. Everybody could lead a cell group. I felt, I'm chuffed. We did our job. I said, God, what's the next question? Which is a setup? Don't let God do that. <laughs> God says, ask them, when last did you lead somebody to Christ? I said, okay, guys, when last did you lead somebody to Christ? Out of the whole 25 cell group leaders. That's, that's the totality of our campus small groups. Only two people in the last six months. Only four people in about 12 months. Another four or five people, for more than 50%, has never led anybody to Christ. The Barna Group has done a study among 22 million evangelical, spiritual, tongue-speaking believers. They found that about 7% of them were properly equipped to engage lost people, and only two has ever had the privilege of leading somebody to Christ. How would you want to go to war? with an army where only 7% is trained and only 2% has ever fired a bullet. I said, God, what do you do? God says, you need to start to equip the people. And we just, I wrote a manual, it's called Braveheart. We didn't have a one-to-one or a purple book back then. And I just started to take these guys and sit down and try to train them. What I do naturally, can I now put that on paper and try to help other people do it? Can it be transferable? Can it be simple, not complex? From the 25 cell groups, we didn't change the names. No more cell groups because people have a certain thing. If you say cell groups, oh, I know what that is. We started to call it connect groups. Say, what, what is that? That's what I want you. I want you to ask questions, not think you know. A connect group is something different. We have elements of cell in it. We're going to care for one another, but it will not become the primary focus anymore. This is the only club that exists for its non-members. All clubs on the face of the earth pay a fee because they want to have membership benefits. They want a membership benefits. It's for the members, and it's only members and exclusive to members. The church is the only club where the members pay a fee to not benefit at all so that those who are not in should benefit. And those guys started to reach out, and from we changed it to connect groups, two years later, there were 92 student-led connect groups on campus. We didn't plan that. That wasn't part of our planning. All we did is, let's obey Jesus. Something kicked in. I'll explain to you what is that power that kicks in. Now, this is not all that happened. These kind of guys, for the first time in their lives, a Madeleine Vessels, she was there. She was just, she led soul group pretty well, but it never multiplied. Then when we changed it over to a little bit more focused and more personal, a little bit smaller, and, 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 and we started to walk with these people, suddenly Madeleine Vessels, for the first time, started to lead people to Christ. And so when she tasted it, she was like a bulldog. I love seeing people get saved and life change. And then she takes those people and says, you make no babies and leave them for adoption. This is not an orphanage. You make babies and put them in family. So you're going to walk with them. You're going to change their nappies. And you guess what? It's the same old boring strokes over and over because it gets bored when you no longer work with babies. But when you work with babies, it's the same thing all over every single time. And as they started to walk, she learned how not just to engage people. She learned to establish people, lay solid foundations, establish faith where they know Jesus and they firmly foundation them in baptism of water, dealing with the past, baptism of spirit, giving them a future. She started to establish them in spiritual family where they start to embrace, this is my family, this, the values, the ways of the family is my ways. These are my values. This is my mission. I'm part of this. She started to establish people in freedom that lost. 
Because anybody who's not free battle to share the gospel that works because a gospel that works sets people free. And then I started to see our groups multiply. One day she comes to me and says, Phil, I'm done. I've, done my, I've finished my studies. I want to go and be a teacher in Abu Dhabi. I said, Madeleine, you're a white Afrikaans lady. That's a Muslim nation. She said, well, that's what you guys preach. I said, hang on, my, my, my one way out would be, let's phone Pastor Ruel. And I said, Pastor Ruel, I mean, Madeleine wants to come and say, oh, send her, we'll cover her. Okay. It's on you now. <laughs> so here Madeleine goes, she's just a student. She had no chest plant training. She arrived in Abu Dhabi. I get an email a month later. A kid got saved. Another kid got saved. A mom got saved. A parent got saved. Teachers got saved. Help! I said, well, you better help. So they went in, and over a period of time, the leaders started to help, and ultimately Pastor Ray Corpus, a friend of mine, went in, and he started to lead that church. That church is today, I don't know, I think over a thousand people. She never led it, but she started it. Why? How could she start it? Because she was a disciple. Kind produces kind. I had a call one day from a friend of mine. I mean, I remember I was preaching in one of the residences in Stellenbosch. In his group, there were two significant moments. There was a group of guys that stood up at the altar call. And on my right-hand side was another guy sitting in the back, and I saw something on his life. And on my left-hand side, another guy standing here, and I saw leadership on this guy. And as he stood up at the altar call, he gave his life to Christ. I walked up to him and said, there's leadership on your life. I really believe there's something God wants to do. I don't know you. I've never met this guy. I said, there's leadership in your life. And if you're serious about what you decided tonight, here's my number. Call me. I'll walk with you, but you need to call me. I'm not going to call you. That same night, he texted me. He said, listen, I want to walk with you. I said, can you make it this week? He said, any time. I, I want to grow spiritually. I finally got into this guy's life, and he realized he was at the end of his life. Something's happened on campus, and he was at a place he needed Jesus. And all I did is take systematic theology, take basic foundations. We didn't have the one-to-one. -one. I took the purple book, and I started to take, said, why don't you go through chapter one, let's say just lesson one, and you come back, and you tell me what did you learn. I'm not going to teach you. I want the Bible of Word of God to become your own conviction. He started to read through it, and he tells me what he's got, and then I can correct and help it. But because he's taken ownership going through it, through things happen. Slowly, devotions are being established. He started to hear God's voice himself. He started to love his own Bible, and I'm teaching him to become a mature person, not always dependent on the system because he's not going to be with me forever. That same guy, two and a half years later, moved back to his nation called Namibia, another nation, he said, my family and friends don't serve Jesus. How, how would he know that? For the first time in his life, he had a definition what it means if you serve Jesus. For the first time in his life, he had a clarity what it means to be a disciple. See, it's vital that you and I are clear what it is and what it's not. He said, they don't serve Jesus. What are you going to do about it? You own a lodge? Why don't you organize? In a matter of two years, about 150 people got saved through that lodge. They started to organize victory weekends. We go in, people come, they want to get set free. They get saved. They get baptized, and they get added to family. Today, 10 years later, there's a church in that small town started by a normal student. He's still an accountant. In fact, we're now giving the church over to a full-time guy. I can tell you stories of Pretoria. I can tell you stories of Paul. I can, these are all normal students. The recent one is a lady, Mariska, and her husband, uh, and our nation, APSA, as a bank, moved them from Paul, the city, to another small town, Janine. They got to this place, and uh, I've never met them. They were my brother's church. And so we started the year, we need to go and help you because something's happening in Zanin. I like it when something's happening there and there's no senior leader. Because it says to me, is there somebody that you can work with here? <laughs> there's something happening with them. And uh, so got to know Mariska. I said, tell me what happened here. She says, no, I walked to the school and there was a mama at the school and she was crying. And all I did is loved her. I reached out to her and said, why are you crying? I said, why don't you come over? My house is just across the street. Took her into her home, started care for her shared the gospel with her, led her to Christ, said, you know what, I can't just lead you to Christ and leave you. Can we see each other weekly? I'll help you. I'll help you means I'll go and, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to disciple you. But because she was disciple, she knew exactly what to do. 
She started to disciple this, this lady. Then the husband came. He got saved. Then they brought their friends. They got saved. When the, by, the time, by the time they called us, listen, we've got six small groups. Can you guys help us plant the church here? And we're not going to lead it. I work for APSA, the guy said. I said, we would have love to have more APSA workers like you. May, may APSA pay for them to go all over the world. And wherever APSA goes and send them, we plant churches. May we have more people who work for FMB. May we have more people who work for, you know, Deloitte and Tooth. And wherever they send them, we plant on their expense. That's cheap church planting. <laughs> Today we're planting a church there. We're sending a leader in to help. But it wasn't started by a senior leader. It was started by a normal believer who believed that they can do extraordinary things. Here's my deep, deep, deep conviction Deep conviction. I believe the power of the church is on the other side of the pulpit. I deeply believe this. I believe the fivefold ministry is given by God to seriously equip the saints. When we equip the saints and we speak the truth and love that we may grow up, Something will start to happen. There's an energy that is released. When normal saints start to believe they can do extraordinary things, we can walk out of that place and all normal saints are penetrating society and you believe that you can do extraordinary things. You're just a normal believer, but you've got an extraordinary power inside of you. Imagine every believer on the face of the earth believes this. There's no man of God syndrome that will ever trump this, ever. There's no venue, there's no event that would ever be able to even match the power that is released when normal believers get beyond the you know, comfort of this and move out and believe, I can do extraordinary things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm more than a conqueror through Christ in me. That you, whoever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory overcomes the world. My faith, my faith in the Son of God. There's something about being born again. You are not just born in to be a doer. You are born in to become a being that can affect the world around you. And the purpose of the church is to raise up people like you that can go into the world and affect the world around you in extraordinary ways because there's no limitation to what God can do in and through you. Imagine every believer on the face of the earth make one disciple a year. Just one in 12 months. Give you enough time here. 12 months. You will find some hour somewhere in 12 months. One disciple every 12 months. And you repeat that every year where every, even the new ones, in 12 months, they start to make one disciple. We will be able to evangelize the whole world within less than 15 years. The power of the church should go beyond the classroom. The power of the church should go beyond this meeting. I believe these meetings are important. Class are important. The moments are important. But it needs to transcend beyond. If I say cell phone, what do you see? Cell phone, just what do you see? You see a mobile phone. All right, what do you see? If I say cell phone, what's the picture in your mind? You see Apple, you see Samson. You see, I've used one word. If I say car, what do you see when I say car? What do you see? Whom of you see a Porsche? Whom of you see a Volkswagen? Whom of you see a broken car because yours is broken? Whom of you see, you know, you know, you see different pictures. I'm using one word, but we see different pictures. See, using one word does not mean we see the same thing. What do you see when we say McDonald's? Food. Food. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you see, there's something you see about it. I mean, who have you gone to McDonald's and you ask McDonald's, can I get a T-bone steak, sir? <laughs> They're going to start laughing. No, no, we don't do T-bone steak. Whom of you have been disappointed going to McDonald's, ask for a T-bone steak and you don't get it? <laughs> this place doesn't serve me. You know, McDonald's. No, you never get disappointed. Why? Because they pre communicated your expectation. If we say discipleship, what do you see? Do we see all different kinds of things? 
Do we, I mean, here we, a global fairy, what do we see? Because it's vital what we see. Because what we see ultimately is what we're going to build. I want to give you a definition that I hope will help you. Write this down. And we're going to get to also what Pastor Steve's saying, but I'm going to give you a definition. A disciple is someone who lives by personal conviction. A disciple is someone who lives by personal conviction of who Jesus is. A disciple is someone who lives by personal conviction of who Jesus is. Based on biblical truth. A disciple is someone who lives by personal conviction of who Jesus is based on biblical truth and he reproduces that in others. Let me unpack this. A disciple is someone who lives by biblical truth, by conviction of who Jesus is based on biblical truth and he reproduces that in others. So let's talk about personal conviction. What is the difference between personal conviction and information? How many of you are well informed, you know, about stuff in the city? You know about it, but that doesn't mean you're convicted about it. You see, conviction that does not flow into action is not a conviction. And many times we could do church and we can do things in church and be in church, and even the leaders, their hearts are there and they're encouraging us. Every one of us have a personal responsibility for the condition of our convictions. A conviction is something that actually flows from a deep understanding. It is a God revelation that always results in earthly action. When we say we're convicted about something, it means that you don't need external control and systems to actually control you doing it anymore. You do this because you're biblically convicted without anybody asking you. Will you keep on doing the things you do with nobody supporting you? That's a conviction. Here's the thing. Let's say Pastor Volvi decides on Sunday he's never ever going to ask the church to pay tithes and offerings ever again. Will you still pay your tithes and offerings or is that a hook off? Great. Uh, thank you. I don't have to do this anymore. You see, personal conviction is something that is going right down to the root of worship. I don't know if you've heard of satanic worship. You know satanic worship? What songs do they sing? Satanic worship. Satanic worship. Okay, that's just my accent, okay? How do you say it? Satanic worship. Um. <laughs> satanic worship, what kind of songs do they sing? Have you ever thought? No, you never think what songs they sing. You always think what life they live. What is Christian worship? Is it the songs we sing? I do believe it includes it, but I don't think it's about it. You see, when we talk about conviction, it has to result in your worship. Now, if you go through John 4, you have this beautiful story of this woman at the well, and Jesus meets this woman at the well, and he starts to speak to this lady, and he says, lady, and he says, who are you to speak to a lady? First of all, we don't do this. You should not, you're not supposed to speak as a Jew to me. And Jesus, but I'm not the normal guy you, you're meeting here. And he says, would you give me some water? And ultimately, Jesus asks her, would you like me to give you some water? And he says, how are you going to draw water? You have no bucket. You've got nothing to draw water from. I mean, again, this lady is absolutely not even in religion. She doesn't know who's speaking to her. He can do it, but she doesn't know it. And Jesus says, the water I give you, if I give this to you, you will never need water again. You see, when we establish people, it means that we make them permanent. Who of you would like to have some permanent guys you walk with? That's what the establish means. It's not the approach, not booklets. It's establishing something that comes to a place that you will never need this again. And Jesus said to this woman, and ultimately they get to the question of worship. And he says, yeah, you guys worship there, and we worship here. And Jesus said, 
I'm looking for worshipers who will worship me in spirit and in truth. And it's like, look, I, I want to worship. And so here go, Jesus goes to the ultimate of worship. He says, let me teach you how to worship. Go call your husband. Oh, no, I don't have a husband. I know. You've got five. And even the one you have now is not your husband. It goes right into the core of society's needs. He touches the deepest area of significance and acceptance in the soul. So how do you know that? See, worship is not just what we sing. Worship is how we live. And this lady is deeply touched by God, I mean by Jesus. Now, here's something that happens in this passage. You can go read through it. The disciples go to town, and they come back, and obviously Jesus walked far, and they think Jesus, I mean, they're very hospitable, okay? They bring Jesus food, and Jesus looked and says, he gets angry at them and says, you don't know what my food is. You don't know what my food is. You've gone to town, you bring me food. That is not my food. My food is the business of my father. That's kind of rude. I mean, thank, just say, thank you, Jesus. Here's the food. He was teaching them a lesson that you could easily get so involved and so stuck in Christianity, so stuck in religion, that you missed the ultimate purpose. This newly, not even trained, nothing, raw, just met Jesus, the woman. She goes to the same town, exactly the same town. She comes back. She does not come with bread. She comes with people. And says, come see, I met somebody who knows everything about me. And these people came and bear on her testimony, they came to meet Jesus. And then something switches at the end of the chapter. And she turns to him and she says, hey, no longer do we believe in Jesus based on your testimony, woman. We now have seen for ourselves. Friends, the principle, the essence of making disciples is bringing people to personal conviction. And that will never happen unless we make them personally responsible. There's a response. I can't bear your sin for you. I cannot commit for you. I can't be generous for you. I can't live holy for you. If you don't want to, that is okay. I'd rather love you for free. But I cannot force you. There must be something where you take ownership and responsibility. Now, how can you ever take ownership if there's no truth? And how will you ever get to the truth if you're not willing to give up your truth? Personal conviction of what? Of who Jesus is. It's not just reading your Bible. You could study the Bible and try to get spiritual facts and do kind of all kinds of, you know, want to be able to communicate with people and participate in conversations and help people with the Word. And you study the Bible. We're not studying this book to get to know facts. We study this book to get to know the person of the book. The Bible itself. You could study it and never know God. Well, the Pharisees memorized it, and Jesus stood in front of them. The Jesus stood in front of them and could not, they could, didn't even recognize him. But they studied the scripture. See, friends, the scripture is not about facts, it's about a person. We want to help people to, based on, you know, the church wants you to, no, the church doesn't want to do anything. This church does not expect anything from you. What is Jesus expecting of you? What is Jesus expecting? What is Jesus saying? See, as we walk and we disciple people to Jesus, here's what happens. It doesn't matter where they go, He goes with them. We want to make sure when people leave where we are, wherever they go, they're going to stay standing because Jesus is with them and they will be able to keep on multiplying because Jesus is with them. On biblical truth, not ideas, not YouTubes, not podcasts that fly in from overseas. It is, what is the Bible saying? The Word of God defines Jesus, not my feelings. And once I have that, the natural response is, I'm going to start out of conviction. I'm going to start to reproduce. 
We don't reproduce if we're not convicted. But our conviction should be word-based and not just feeling. If you get a revelation from the Word of God, it's great. But make sure what you disciple is not your revelation. What you disciple is systematic theology. It's basic biblical truth that people can stand on that will sustain them. I want to end this session with you sitting here this morning. And I really believe the grace of God is available to all of us. What is grace? Grace is God giving us supernatural ability to get right what is humanly impossible. Grace is not the absence of holiness. Grace is the only foundation for holiness. Grace is the only foundation for obedience. See, obedience by itself is a daunting thing. And here's the thing that we need to have and understand. Christianity is not difficult. It's not. It's impossible. Religion is difficult. Religion is based on, you're going to sit here and you're going to feel condemned and what must you do and you write down, no, 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 let me tell you, religion is what's based on your effort and how you need to go and do this. And if you do this well, you can maybe get some acceptance and you're going to get some significance, which means those two areas need small gospel. It's not based on our performance. It's impossible, which means I need an outside force, an outside strength to help me. Lord, I need you. I'm going to do this. I'm going to step out of faith, but if you don't go with me, it's going to be a mess. Help me. So I want to pray now. That just whatever God's done in your heart now, would you allow the Holy Spirit just to work tenderly with your heart and say, Lord, I want to be for life. Just a disciple who loves you. And I want to learn how to reproduce what you've done in my heart and other people's hearts so that they can love you also. Just close your eyes. Father, we come before you. First of all, thank you that we're saved. And thank you that you're continuing to save, continue to save us daily. You sanctify us. We've got so much to be thankful for. Lord, I pray that you would cancel all strive. That everyone sitting here today would have a deep breath in this. Thank you, God, that you're my Lord and Savior. And with, apart from you, I can do nothing. But with you, we can do all things. Thank you that your grace empowers us to do what is humanly impossible. And we ask you for grace today. If there's areas where God convicts you, why don't you just say sorry? Sorry, Lord. If there's fear, ask God to fill it with love, because love drives out all fear. If you're intimidated by the city and things around us and the challenges out there, may God inspire you with His truth in your heart. Thank you, God. Amen, amen.